Hey everyone, welcome to the Smart Attack podcast. My name is Nick, the EMF guy, Pino. I'm the author of the non tinfoil guide to EMFs and an advocate for safe technology. Today, I want on this podcast slash video version now on YouTube, if you're listening, well, YouTube, we all know YouTube is censoring a lot of stuff. We're early 2021 as I'm recording this. YouTube don't censor this because I'm only sharing the science around electromagnetic fields and their health effects, please. Anyhow, uh, there's always a link on BitChute as well in case we're getting the platform. So happy 2021 with censorship and everything married as happening. This episode is going to be a fairly quick one. What I want to show you is that EMF dangers, the dangers and the the dangers of electromagnetic fields, call it electropollution if you want. That's a better term I've been using in the last year and I think it makes more sense for everyone to to say that. Electropollution, cell phones, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth stuff, smart meters, but also all the wireless technologies and beyond because it encompasses also the quality of electricity, household electricity, magnetic fields, and a lot of stuff that uh, I talk about with Brian Hoyer in my course, Electropollution Fix. But the goal of this episode is to show you that it's been known for more than 50 years, but the truth is more than 250 years, as you'll see that there there are health effects related to these fields at levels, orders of magnitude lower than what is considered safe and allowed um, to the public, the exposure that the public is getting these days. So again, we can argue what is safe, what is unsafe, but generally speaking, if people have health effects and symptoms in the short or long run, we can say that a certain agent like um, environmental toxin is problematic and we should aim to reduce it. And uh, I argue today that electropollution is in this category. So let me share my screen for a second. If you're listening to the video version of this presentation, um, you'll enjoy it even more. So please uh, jump on there. Uh, on YouTube or BitChute and watch this. If you're not watching it, I'll read some passage and you'll you'll still get a lot of value out of uh, the audio version, of course. This is the, the website of SellerTaskForce.org, an organization fighting for safe technologies um, launched by Arthur Furstenberg and uh, a lot of collaborators. Unfortunately, I'm not familiar with them, so sorry about that, guys. But a lot of people, great people that are themselves uh, suffering from electro hypersensitivity and the symptoms of this electropollution. Certain people seem to be extremely uh, sensitive to this agent, just like a lot of people are very sensitive to um, air pollution because they have a certain genetic profile or certain things that happen in their life and maybe their lungs got damaged. Uh, now they have only one lung, for example, and then you can bet that they will be more affected by air pollution than I will as a healthy adult with two lungs, right? So it's also something to keep in mind. So going back to Cellular ta Task Force, Archer Furstenberg is a scientist and this is the best book on EMFs that I ever read. Yeah, okay, I've got... Just gonna plug my book here because it's Indiana gonna make a living. That's the non tinfoil guide to EMFs. That's a book I wrote in 2017. It's still a good introduction to the topic. If you're listening to this and you say this guy is full of sh something, uh, and there's no science between uh, no link between cell phones and and uh, any kind of uh, biological effects. Well, read this. It's the lay layman version this is the bible version it's a long read but it's uh very palatable uh the invisible rainbow by archer Furstenberg: a history of electricity and life in this book Furstenberg demonstrates that in this around the 1750s 1746 if i remember correctly in the intro uh scientists and various people started experimenting with electric shocks. Uh, at first, it was static electricity, and they could not 
really uh, store this energy. So they had the big apparatus to create static shocks. And even then, at this level of exposure to electricity, and all electricity creates various types of electromagnetic fields, some people were very sensitive. So the health effects in reality have been first observed the moment humanity started playing with electricity. So that's something to keep in mind. That's more than 250 years ago. And they saw some health effects. Certain people got symptoms that even today we see associated with electropollution, heart palpitations, people getting uh, um, insomniac or all sorts of symptoms. And then, of course, even back in the days, it was a fraction of the population of our of participants who got shocked for uh, it was for therapy it was for pleasure it was for entertainment it was a new thing at the time in the 1750s and uh, early 1800s so some people were getting sick or were not feeling good because of this exposure so read this book just want to mention it because it goes um way beyond what I can share in this quick presentation. There are some documents I want to review that are on the uh, website ca called ORSA. That's the Oceanic uh, Research... I'm going to butcher this. Hold on just a second. So <laughs> I actually haven't studied the, the acronym. ORSA, Oceania... Radio Frequency Scientific Advisory Association. These guys are the real deal. Independent researchers, they have a huge data database on EMFs. They talk about conflicts of interest, just like I talked about in this episode of uh, Season 1. It's going to be in the show notes slash in uh, the description of this video. You're going to find it. there. I, I've got an entire episode about conflict of interest because when you talk about electropollution, People who produce devices which create electropollution, they don't like this sort of discussion. They don't like to fund studies which find health effects, of course. So there's a huge bias towards no effect. And um, this organization, ORSA, did an amazing job identifying that the funding sources of EMF-related studies will influence the outcomes greatly. But... If you've been studying science for a while and how much corporate influ influence is a factor in interpreting science, you already knew that. On the ORSA website, there's a very interesting report here, 1979, uh, sorry, uh, early research on the biological effects of microwave radiation. So now we're going to talk about microwave radiation. What is microwave radiation, if you're not familiar with it? Well, microwave radiation is sometimes, it, I know engineers won't like it, but some it's, it, it's a similar range as radio frequency radiation, and we can just call it for the lay people out there, wireless radiation. So the wireless stuff, right? It's early research on what wireless does to your body, especially in military personnel because at the time the main source of exposure of microwave was on military bases on submarines on i don't know anything really they started putting radar everywhere around world war ii and it was really a marvelous technology that could tell you when the enemy is going to attack right but they started seeing health effects on operators so 1940 to 1960 and yes this is the same type of stuff that's emitted by wi-fi and your cell phone it's just that radar generally speaking has specific frequencies uh it's extra pulsed and then the intensity might be quite high and chances are that these operators were exposed to levels to be fair that are higher than the average layperson who's using a cell phone. So that's to be fair, but still, occupational exposure to microwave radiation at the time was already showing health effects. So basically, they, they talked about something called the tri-service program. Basically, the military wanted to know for sure at the end of these, uh, these, uh, this uh, time frame here, so 1957 to 1960, they wanted to know, well, what is the health effect on military personnel? There was a huge controversy at the time, and they really wanted to know 
should we worry that our guys are gonna drop dead, right? So basically, here you go on page, uh, what is it, 345. So basically what happened is that the Trive Service program looked at thermal effects. So acute exposure, a huge exposure to a radar, so being in close vicinity to a radar for a fairly short duration. And they looked at basically what they found is that if you overheat the human body, it's a problem and you get health effects. You might get a sort of a fever and then you increase uh, internal temperature of the human body. You, you screw it up and you can induce a lot of stress this way. But they also, the researchers were looking at the hypothesis that there are such thing as non-thermal effects. So health effects, biological effects, for example, it could be a change in hormones, it could be a change in sleep quality, it could be a change in mood, for all we know. Many effects, reproduction, right? They all happen at non-thermal thresholds. What does, it, what does it mean? Well, if you have a microwave uh, signal, for example, a radar, or let's take a cell phone, and you're not overheating the human body, researchers thought, well, it looks like there are still health effects. But what happened with this commission, the Tri-Service Program, is that they concluded, well, you know, there's we don't think there are really uh, that the distinction between thermal and non-thermal is a meaningful one. So we don't think it's meaningful for military personnel. So to be fair, the researchers uh, who are uh, analyzing what happened in the 40s and 60s, they say, well, it's important to know that the common techniques for studying uh, mutagenesis, car uh, carcinogenesis, and Tetra, tetra, tetratogenesis, my God, my French Canadian accent is struggling here. We're in their infancy in the late 1950s. Environmental studies and the notion of environmental impact were just beginning to emerge as important issues. So in other words, the science was not very mature as far as environmental toxins and their health effects go. So it was missing. And basically, they say the problem of microwave exposure was seen primarily as one that concerned the military and its defense contractors. Planners were not looking ahead um, of, to the general saturation of the environment with this new form of energy. So basically, they did not study the long-term effects because it's short-term, it's a few young folks that are radar operators. If they get sick, well, we put them on leave or they, they won't last in the army for 60 years anyway. And these guys can handle risk. And that's all right because in the end, I mean, what is the risk of going to war, right? It's, it's pretty substantial. You get injured, you get killed, you get shot, uh, you get bombed, whatever. But... The military considered, well, you know what? These effects are not dramatic enough for us to worry about it. So that's in the 40s and 60s. Another document, that's a NASA technical translation. So the NASA wanted to know uh, that that's been um, edited or translated by I.R. Petrov. And that's in 1972, NASA technical translation called Influence of Microradiation on the Organism of Men and Animals. So basically, they translated an entire document, uh, I cannot read that, uh, in Leningrad in 1970, the original manuscript. So it's a translation from a document that looks in, I think, I think it's Czech, but basically in in Eastern Europe at the time, and in Russia, and honestly in everywhere besides the Western world, these fields and the non-thermal effects were widely recognized. So basically you have here in the table of content, and that's from 1970, you have influence of microradiation at high, uh, high intensities, which is thermal, right? But you have an entire part here that's called influence of low non-thermal intensity microradiation on the organism. 
And then they go into central nervous system, cardiovascular system, digestive organs, excretory system, blood system. Then you talk about change in uh, immunological reactivity of the organism and the properties of bacteria, viruses. Uh, So in other words, for them, it's clear that there are non-thermal effects, or at least the review of the of the literature in many different languages that have been translated from 1970, it was clear in these countries, or it was established, call it scientific consensus in that country, that there were non-thermal effects. And then they talk about influence of microwave radiation on the human body. So we're interested in that. We're going to dive into that a little bit. But basically, I want to show you something, influence of low-intensity microradiation on the organism. And they talk, well, changes in functions of various systems of the organism. They talk about the nerve, central nervous system here. Uh, and you can read uh, all these documents are going to be in the show notes if you're listening to the audio or under the video. And it's, it's simply interesting to see that many of these intensity are quite high if you're uh, very uh, technically oriented, you'll be able to translate what these exposures are. Sometimes they're, uh, so these are uh, intensity levels of microradiation. For example, one milliwatt per centimeter square. So you're going to have to play around with different uh, tr- uh, kind of, not translation, but uh, conversion tools to come up with the right numbers compared to today's exposures. But I can tell you that some of these exposures are comparable to what we're getting and some are higher. So to be fair, some are quite high and people get do not get these types of exposures unless you happen to live right next to a cell tower in India or in certain countries where um, at, at times they've been found to, well, even North America, you could be living right next to a cell tower. And unfortunately, especially in the US and Canada, you don't have a third party um, governmental service which takes readings to ensure that these towers are even uh, following their own guidelines. So it's a little bit the. Uh, it's a little bit sketchy what's happening in North America, whereas in France, for example, you can uh, you actually have um, a governmental body that ensures that the rules are being followed. So it's a little bit better. Going into that document a little bit further, page, uh, it's probably 100, 100 uh, 105, 100, yeah, exactly. Influence of microwave irradiation on the human organism. Uh, functional changes in healthy humans exposed to low intensity, again, non-thermal effects. So basically they talked about something called, and it's right here, they talk about the human auditory analyzer, uh, and that's uh, studies by by someone called uh, Alan Frey, and that's actually from the US, a guy from the US military, and uh, he found that an intensity of around 0.3 milliwatt per centimeter square. And as a comparison, that's uh, 0.3 is comparable to what some people are getting or close to. It's around 19 to 20 volts per meter. I'm going to express these numbers in, in volts per meter, right? Uh, but he also found another researcher, Gusarov, in 1966, found that 40 to a thousand microwatts per centimeter square. Well, I can tell you 40 microwatts per centimeter square. And he said, well, people get certain reactions like uh, basically they, they have more more errors and they're more confused and they have uh, cognitive abilities that go down. 40 microwatts per centimeter square is quite low. Low in the sense that if you talk on a cell phone, you have that exposure. If you spend all day near your Wi-Fi router, you have that exposure. And even this exposure, 40 microwatts per centimeter square, is around uh, 6 to 8 volts per meter, if I'm not mistaken. You have a report here. That's from Ontario, Canada. In Let me find the date here. 2014. It's all going to be in the show notes. They took basically an average of what are children exposed to if they're under the router in school. And the average exposure in these schools was 
very, very high, around 12 volts per meter. It's actually twice as much as the study in 1996, which found cognitive ability loss at these at basically at these levels. So we can say again, it's not to claim that children, um, you know, it's it's not to claim extraordinary health effects in, instantaneously, but that's not the goal here. It's just to say, well, your cognitive abilities might be impaired even in the short run. So it's very, it's very interesting to see that these levels are comparable even to what some people are getting downtown in uh, Stockholm, for example. Well, and I could say, Certain areas of Montreal, I saw um, studies from Italy where the saturation of uh, these electro, this electro pollution is quite high. And basically, it was a paper on 5G and the engineer said, oops, we're in trouble because it's already saturated. We cannot add 5G on top of it. We, we need to actually have more permissive guidelines to be able to roll out 5G, the fifth generation of cellular networks, because we have all these 4G, 3G towers and all these Wi-Fi routers, and we're taking readings with a meter, and the power density is so high that we're almost going over the level. Uh, here, uh, the Yach, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, I won't even attempt uh, my Swedish accent, your target uh, square in Stockholm, Old Town, Sweden in May 2018, and they talk about the maximum reading of around 12 volt per meter, so comparable to what children were getting in that classroom in Ontario, that's quite high here. And that was, of course, the median value was five volt per meter, but even then, five volts per meter, it is close enough to what, to that 1966 study that showed that's the lowest level at which the speed and and basically the the speed of people's mental ability went down so it's a, it's impacting again non thermal effects very important what do we have here already talked about this one and then the conclusion of this entire document translated by nasa in 1972 well basically they said in these countries on the basis of all this research we should have a recommended safe level for exposure um, ex throughout the day should be 0 0.1 milliwatt per centimeter square. 0 0.1 milliwatt per centimeter square. So stick with me, you don't, you don't have to know all this, but if I go on PowerWatch uh, in milliwatt per centimeter square, so it was 0 0.1. So that means, it means that, it means that we're in trouble, 0.1. So 0.1 is 19 point, uh, 0.4. So it should be a maximum of 19.4. We're good with that, but they say, well, we should go below that. We should be at 0 0.01 microwatts per centimeter square. So it, we should be at a maximum exposure of 6.14 volts per meter. I'm doing this translation, the, the conversion here, because uh, it's, it's a better way of expressing uh, the peak levels of microradiation. So anyway, just understand this. For the Eurasian countries in 1970, it was already clear that the public should not be exposed to more than six volts per meter. If you talk on a cell phone, chances are you're going above that. If you have a cell phone in your pocket, chances are you're going above that. If you are near a Wi-Fi router all day, every day, chances are you're above that. If you live right next to a cell tower and it happens to, uh, to be right line of sight to you, chances are that you're above that. So in these countries, it was already clear 51 years ago that these levels are not safe for the public. So just saying that, this is again, scientifically speaking, this is, this is correct. On top of that, something else I'm gonna add to this discussion is the fact that these studies were done on radar, but nowadays the technologies have become more and more complicated. Engineers tamper with the signals and it makes it, or there's an argument that could say it makes it more stressful to you. So for the same units of radiation, let's say six units of radiation, you might get more biological effects for six units 
of 5G compared to 6 units of 4G. Why is that? Well, you tamper with the signal, you make it more and more complicated, you play with different signal characteristics, and it m might cause more health effects. And that's uh, Dr. Martin Paul from Washington State University and multiple researchers have had the chance to interview or to listen to, to learn from, have told me that in the past. So it is very likely that this is the case and that the type of electropollution we're exposed to these days is much more stressful to the human organism or any biological beings, including animals and plants and bacteria for that matter. Uh, compared to the exposure in 1970. Another document, let's jump into the Naval Medical uh, Research Institute, NMRI, 1971. It's a bibliography of reported biological phenomena, effects, and clinical manifestations attributed to microwave and radiofrequency radiation. Research report by Dr. Zorak Glazer, PhD. Basically at the time, October 4, 1971, that's all, that's all stuff that is available on the internet now and either declassified or either just scanned and publicly available. Dr. Glazer, in fact, um, allowed Dr. Magda Havis and, well, the entire planet to look at his work now that he's, uh, that he's um, retired. So basically, that's an entire bibliography where he had 2,300 studies. And he, he, in fact, Dr. Magda Havis now possesses those 2,300 uh, 2, studies or 2,300 studies on biological effects at different intensity levels, including intensity levels comparable to what we use today. And that was done for the U.S. military, for the, Na for the Navy. And basically what happened, Dr. Magda Havis, she's from Trent University in uh, Ontario, Canada, and she talked to Dr. Glazer and she basically arranged to get his entire work, his entire life work in boxes, like the real paper trail that he left, 40 or 50 boxes, and she has it in storage somewhere in Ontario, I don't know how, and she, she's trying to come up with the financing to uh, scan these studies. But basically what Dr. Glazer said is that he has more than 6,000 studies on the bio effects and health effects of radio frequency and microwave radiation. And a number of these were studies showing that exposure to this radiation was able under certain conditions to produce changes and some of which could be considered dangerous even at low level where such exposure did not heat the body. So there's substantial evidence throughout these studies that it's not good and this is all evidence prior to 1972. Going into another document, the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the classified document uh, now that's uh, 1976. And basically, they looked at biological effects of microwave, uh, well, electromagnetic radiation, so radio waves and microwaves, Eurasian communist countries. So they looked at different uh, Eurasian countries, and they wanted to know, well, are they using uh, microwave range weapons? Uh, what are their safety standards? And what's up with that? Because Eurasian countries were al allowing their military personnel to be exposed to quite low levels of that electropollution. And they were surprised because they said, well, are, are, are they... Are we overexposing our people? So again, the military always had this, this kind of um, fear that of exposing their guys and gals, uh, military personnel, to too much of an agent, right? It's always like that. They, they want to know the risk benefit. They want their troops to be combat ready. So they want things to work. So they want to study it. And they were really uh, surprised that uh, the Eurasian countries and the, for example, the USSR in uh, 1958 had much more stringent safety standards, so lower uh, allowed levels of electropollution for their military personnel. 
So they said this, uh, if the more advanced nations of the West are strict in the enforcement of stringent exposure standards, such as the one found in the USSR in the 1950s, there could be unfavorable effects on industrial output and military functions. So in other words, our telecommunications in 1970 and beyond, they could be in trouble because we'll have to keep the levels low and we will not be able to roll out the cell phones and the different systems, especially those rolled out by the military. So already they saw that, oh my God, well, we should probably not follow these standards because it's going to be bad for business and bad for our military advantage. And that's really, military advantage is one thing, but the problem is we took the standards and the industry, the telecoms, took these standards and said, yes, 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 these standards are super good because they allow us to roll out whatever we want and be okay with it. So they're very permissive, in other words. If we go a little bit uh, at the end of the document here, we look at the standards. Well, the new standards uh, permitted unlimited exposure of humans to field intensities of 0.01. So 0.01 is that quite low. Eight hours per day is permitted 0.2. So 0.2. So basically eight hours per day at 27 volts per meter. That's quite high. It is a little bit, a little bit permissive, but it depends on different countries. So basically, uh, prior to June 1973, uh, the maximum radiation exposure levels for all non-ionizing radiation, that's micro radiation is in that category, was 0.01 for up to eight hours per day. So which is the same safety standard for the USSR. So they, they have safety standards that vary between all of these different countries, but generally speaking, they do not like their personnel to be exposed to um, a Wi-Fi router all day. Like a lot of people these days in their everyday life are being exposed to levels that are higher than what the military, healthy, young military personnel were allowed to be exposed to back in the 1970s and, be, and, uh, and before that, 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s. So it's something to keep in mind. These guys had to put suits on to reduce their exposure, EMF blocking suits, if they were exposed to higher levels than that. So it's very different than the extra permissive, almost unlimited levels of electropollution that are allowed in the general population. Another document, and I know it's a lot of examples, but stick with me here. It's the last one that's really worth it. Health Implications of Long-Term Exposure to Electrosmog by uh, Dr. Uh, Carl Hecht um, from Germany, if I'm not mistaken. And he's uh, along with many, many colleagues here, which you can read about uh, Klaus Buschner and a lot of researchers uh, I know about and really respect. That's uh, trend that's been translated uh, fairly recently, uh, 2016, a few years back. And basically, it's uh, is the amal amalgam basically of 878 studies from the Soviet uh, era, so Russian studies between 1960 and 1997. What they say is this, to pretend as if there were no connection between microwave technologies from the past and those from today is like burying one's head in the sand. Huh. Well, they review what we already knew or what the Russians knew about microwave radiation and their short or long-term effect. One jam that is in this document that I invite any any geek listening to this to review in, in uh, length, it's it's this screenshot from uh, the professional level course uh, I've launched um, many years, well, three years ago, Electrosmog RX. Uh, it's going to be in the show notes too. But it, basically, they talk about three stages of exposure uh, at which they observe that different, different um, basically, symptoms start appearing after a few years. Three to five years working under 
certain types of exposures and that's in military personnel they talk about uh, heart arrhythmia they talk about uh, skin response uh, uh, or skin skin arteries to histamine so they have basically uh, red redness on the skin or a sort of aller allergic reaction to the signal and then they have fatigue and insomnia and then it gets worse and worse and worse more than 10 years you're starting to have uh like what they call a psychosomatic complex of symptoms so people are getting depressed when they are exposed to these levels but what are these levels of electropollution that these soviet workers were exposed to well the exposure in russian studies was in that case 0 0.15 volts per meter and the magnetic field was quite high and the electric field was quite high so they were also working with machines and being exposed to a lot of electricity to be fair and that's probably way over what the average lay person is getting exposed to but in the rf range that's a microwave radiation or radio frequency they were exposed to minute levels well the usa safety guidelines you can be exposed to uh 10 million microwatts per meter square which is quite quite higher than the 60 in the Russian studies. And to translate that or to convert that in um, volts per meter, that's 61. So basically, orders of magnitudes lower than USC safety guidelines and uh, orders of magnitude lower when it comes to other types of field, magnetic fields, electric fields that I won't get into because it's too technical for this discussion. But I just want to say that one could make the argument that again, once again, you saw health effects in military personnel, heart arrhythmias, insomnia, anxiety, depression, brain fog, fatigue, unexplained illness in young people. And it does match the pattern that we're seeing in the overall pop population. So is electropollution the sole reason that people have health effects these days and we're seeing a chronic disease ep epidemic no of course not but it's part of the factors the environmental factors that are a big question mark for me and researchers in the emf space we don't know exactly how much it's a contributor we know for sure though that when you remove the agent when you reduce the levels most people feel the benefits and i can claim that and i won't say what these benefits are it's, it's nothing necessarily miraculous but some people report more energy or better sleep for example and you got to try it for yourself turn off the cell phone at night turn off the wi-fi at night and see how you feel and it's not any medical claim here or anything crazy like that but certain functional medicine doctors or these doctors who are aware of the electropollution problem see huge effects in their patient population when they reduce the agent right i mean if it's only improving sleep by 20 percent if you sleep in a in a lower electropolluted room it can be tremendous it can be incredible for longevity for blood sugar regulation for example for cancer risks so we know anecdote and anecdotally that it makes a huge difference and that's something to also consider in the evidence presented to you so that's something we recommend all our course members uh, the course that i've launched with brian hoyer last year is called electropollution fix and our goal is to help people reduce electropollution in their home quite simply a lot of people report feeling better and it's no it's not just the placebo effect for some people it might be but some people quantify these things such with uh with with uh, quantification devices such as this ring i'm showing to you the aura ring o-u-r-a and some people see an increase in their rem and deep sleep and it's measurable before and after less electropollution they sleep better more electropollution they sleep less soundly it's not that surprising to me especially concerning all the all the data we have around the possible link with melatonin but also multiple other links we have let's go into what happened in 2018 three years ago clear evidence of cancer concludes us ntp national toxicology program so basically they looked at 20 years basically 20 years of 
an entire saga, right, around, okay, we're going to prove that electropollution from cell phones does nothing. We're going to prove it's safe. And they failed to do that. They, in fact, they've proven the opposite. But was it really necessary to prove it? Concerning, c considering that the health effects were known in the 1940s and that the health effects were known in the 1750s or they were thought, they were hypothesized or observed. Now you tell me if there's any evidence that electropollution is a problem we urgently need to look at. And you tell me if you think that rolling out 5G and using a thousand different Bluetooth devices at home and uh, installing a Wi-Fi router in your kid's bedroom or under your bed, like I saw it, it, it happened in the hotel room that I visited in Austin, Texas. You tell me if it's a good idea. You tell me if it's a good idea to have such permissive safety guidelines or you tell me if it's a good idea to launch uh, probably 100,000 satellites within 10 to 20 years. Multiple corporations are working at it like uh, SpaceX and whatnot. You tell me if it's a good idea or you tell me if we should adopt the precautionary principle instead lower our exposure, turn off the cell phone at night, not wear it in the pocket all day uh, close to your genitals, and just overall start reducing these levels of electropollution. Because it, it seems to me that we're really going in the wrong direction here. So the conclusion of this episode, well, of course, it's daunting. My God, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a lot to take in, right? These dangers were known. What can I do about it? Well, you can do something about it. Like I said, try to create distance between the devices and you. Try to work off of an Ethernet cable, a cabled connection instead of Wi-Fi like I do at home. I'm going to have more videos. I'm going to have more tutorials on my website. And many episodes of the Smarter Tech podcast go into practic practical tips you can start doing to minimize your exposure. You can also look at uh, the courses and more advanced education that I provide as an uh, an advocate for safe technologies like the electropollution fix course for people who want to reduce their exposure at home. And there's also Electrosmog RX, which is a, a collaboration I've done with medical doctors and scientists containing the best evidence we have on a medical standpoint on how you can support your patients or clients through the process of reducing their electropollution and how it can help you maybe get better results with people. Because in the end, we're exposed to so much stress these days. Electropollution is just one of them. It's one of them that we have control over and one of them that we should each aim to reduce. So I hope you like this episode. I'm going to be back with a few uh, solo casts like this in the future. And uh, I hope you learned something today. I'm Nick Pino signing out. Bye-bye. Take care.